beginning parshas Vaera, and uh, the Jewish people are still trying to leave Egypt and to break away from the constraints of evil that exist and that are holding them back. And uh, as we go, as we said on Shabbos, that uh, whatever is happening to the Jewish people in the Parshios is happening to us as individuals as well. It's not just a historical event that's a cute thing to remember, but just like Mitzrayim, the word Mitzrayim means the constraints that are placed upon a nation. So everyone has the constraints that they try to get through at this time of year. So that's what we're, uh, we're trying to learn messages from this Torah portion to apply to our daily lives. And in this week's Torah portion, we are introduced to the ten plagues. Now we know whenever we look at something, we look at the beginning of something to give us the tone of what it's all about. And that's the same thing over here. So we're going to focus today on the first plague primarily and to see what message the Jewish people got from the plague and what message we're supposed to get from the plague. That's the, the goal for today. So you look in the first uh, two sources on the page. It says like this. In all the water that was in the river changed to blood, the fish life that was in the water died, and the river became foul. Egypt could not drink water from the river, and the blood was throughout the land of Egypt. That was the first plague. Now, the, the Medrash goes on to great detail, how far, describing how far-reaching this plague was. It got to the point where the Egyptians really wanted water and couldn't have any water. The Medrash says that even, let's say, okay, I can't have any water, so I'll, I'll take an orange. And orange has got liquid in it, right? So the Medrash says that all fruits, the juice was blood. Everything was blood. There was no way out of this. Okay, any type of liquid that had some kind of nutritional value was all blood. So, but on the other hand, the Egyptians noticed that when the Jew went to a well, and drew water, they had water. And the Jews were drinking water, and the Egyptians were drinking blood. So let's pick up now the Medrash, the second source. So the Egyptians weren't stupid. They figured like this. Okay, they tell the Jew, listen, give me that glass of water you have there. She says, okay, take the glass of water. Takes the glass of water, puts it in his mouth, turns to blood. Hmm, that's not going to work either. So now they have the final option. And what's that? Look at the second source. Even if an Egyptian shared a jar of water with a Jew, he says, okay, Jew, we're going to drink this glass of water at the same time. Now that way, you, uh, your guy's not going to let you drink blood. You're going to drink water. And if you're going to drink water, then the pitcher's going to be water. You know, Milty, maybe you better um, turn there because... You could just angle me from this side. You'd be closer even. Perfect. So, uh, and then we'll all drink at the same time. There's no way I'm going to have blood when you're having water. And the Medrash says that you drank water while the liquid that ran down the Egyptian's throat was blood. That's what the Medrash says. So, what do we see over here based on what the Medrash is saying? That there's a lot of emphasis being placed on a miracle, if you think about the miracle that's going on over here, where on the one hand, let's think for a minute, on one hand, when the Jew is drinking water, is there a miracle going on? No, because water is supposed to be water. When, when you're drinking water and it's water, that's, that's not anything out, out of the ordinary, right? But on the other hand, when the Egyptian is drinking the water, the water is turning into blood. So, it seems that, th that two things are functioning at the same time. It's, in other words, to suggest it's natural for the Jew to be drinking water, but the blood, that's the miraculous state, and those states seem to be working simultaneously. That's what this Midrash is pointing out. The Midrash, you know, the, the, the Torah just says there's lots of blood. There's lots of blood. The Egyptians couldn't drink any blood. The Medrash goes to great lengths to show that even though it was blood for the Egyptians, it was water for the Jew, at the same time, 
And obviously the Medrash is showing that there's something great about uh, God being revealed when a miracle and a natural effect are working simultaneously as opposed to, let's say, you know, one, one general miracle. Now, who picks up on this in a bigger way? It's the Maharal. The Maharal in Furus Hashem, I've got the Hebrew and I gave you a little bit of the English over here. The Maharal makes note of this. And I'm going to just paraphrase what he says. This is based on the Medrash Tanchuma that I just quoted for you, or different Medrashim. I'll read a little bit of, uh, in Hebrew, and you got the English there. He says, Nim That the water was natural for the Jew, but not natural for the Egyptian. It was this, there was nature and beyond nature working simultaneously. And he says, so it was in many of all the plagues, really, let's say, darkness. Now, how did, what exactly happened in darkness? Well, when the Egyptian looked, what he saw was dark. He looked in, in the atmosphere, it's dark. The Jew looks at the same atmosphere, and it's light. So what's the way it's supposed to be in the middle of the day? It's supposed to be light. The Jew is seeing things in a natural state. The Egyptian is seeing things in a not natural straight state. And it's happening simultaneously. Now, and you, you can't say that the Egyptians uh, were, let's say, inflicted with a cataract disease in all their eyes. And therefore the Egyptians were plagued with a cataract disease and the Jews not. That, that's not logical. But rather he's saying that it was just dark for them. So you have two opposites at the same time again. At the very same time, the Jews looking in the air, it's, it's, it's clear, it's light. The Egyptians looking in the air, it's dark. So he says, Yoser, this reveals more. When this happens this way, it reveals more. It shows much greater ability of the one who's doing it. Um, that God only makes a miracle for the one he needs to make the miracle for and the one who doesn't need the miracle he leaves it in the natural state so it comes out we have two opposites in one situation and one is natural and one is supernatural so, what is the morale saying over here? The morale is saying that if God does a miracle across the board that affects everybody, that's one thing. But it's a much bigger trick, as it were, to, to make a miracle for part and not a miracle for the other, all at the same time. That is a greater manifestation of God's power when he works nature and miracles simultaneously in the same area. So this was an outstanding thing. So now the question is, what what is uh, what do we learn from this morale? Right? But you hear what's going on over here. God, let's say, could make a miracle. Everything turns to blood, and the Jew suffers with the blood too. Still a miracle. God's punishing the Egyptians. But on the other hand, the Jews are suffering. Miraculous it is, but a much greater miracle is the very same pitcher of water that the Egyptian, that God miraculously changes, does not miraculously change, remains the same for a Jew. That's an incredible miracle. So what is the morale, and how does this fit in to, uh, so, okay, great, so God did that. So what's the message for us? So, Rav Yitzhak Hutner of blessed memory, who was a late Rashiva and Rashiva Chaim Berlin, New York, spent a lot of time uh, making many discourses based on the morale, and he talks about this idea. And now we're going to go into this area where you're gonna, I'm gonna be referring, referring to the board, and you're gonna see a very nice, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it exactly. Columns of uh, showing you uh, differences in history. As when we'll come to the board, I did it last night to save us time. I don't know if the people on the camera world are going to see it. Maybe a little bit later we'll adjust the camera. But there's only so many limitations to a, a stationary ca camera. So let's take a look at uh, the Gomorra in Sanhedrin, the, f uh, the fourth source, the Gomorra in Sanhedrin says the following, there are two verses in Psalms that seem to contradict each other. On the one hand, King David says, Tov Hashem Lakol. Hashem is good to everybody. Okay? Hashem is good to everybody. Another verse says, this is a verse, not in Psalms, this verse is in Eicha, 
It says, Tov Hashem Likovav. Hashem is good to those who wait for Him. Which means to imply that Hashem is only good for those who seek Him and others not. In other words, He's only good to the righteous. So what's going on? One person, King David says, Hashem is good to everybody. And the prophet in Eicha says, Hashem is only good to those who wait for him. How do you understand that? So the Gemara resolves the contradiction by giving us an analogy. They give us an analogy to a farmer who has an orchard. So a farmer does a lot of things with an orchard. One of the things is he irrigates the orchard. So when he irrigates the orchard, and I'm sure you do the same thing when you water your lawn, right? When you water, you water the entire orchard. When you're, when you're watering it, you know, the water goes and it waters, all, you, 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 they let, let, let the waters flood in, let's say, and it would just go through a whole orchard. Let's say you have a little uh, lake nearby, you irrigate it, and you allow the water to go through and everything gets watered. Okay, that's like one shot. One shot, the water covers everything and waters it. However, when he has to hoe and dig holes around the trees, now that's that's got, that's a specific focused effort. Gamora says he digs only around the good trees in the orchard, the one that's worth digging. If I got a tree that's producing, I'm going to hoe it. I'm going to work around it to make sure it continues to produce. If I got a rotten tree that doesn't produce anything, why would I bother to hoe it? So uh, when you water, well, the water you let the floodgates open, the whole field gets watered anyway, regardless of how good the trees are producing. But uh, but uh, that's one action that takes care of the whole orchard. But when you have to do individual work on each tree, you're going to focus on the good trees. So the Gemara is explaining two different ways in which God takes care of the world. We're going to call it the way of watering and the way of hoeing. God's ways of doing things. So coming back to the nice half, put that on the board, you see? We got on the first line says, Tov Hashem Lakol on one side, God is good to all. On the other side, Tov Hashem Lakol up. Hashem is good to those who seek Him out. Below I've given you the analogy of watering and hoeing, which means the following. Sometimes Hashem will extend a particular kindness to the whole world. A kindness that is akin to watering. It hits the whole world at once. For example, well, not today. Well, it is, but we don't see it. When the sun rises in Toronto, who does it rise for? Only the righteous? It rises for everyone who lives in the city. Everyone benefits from the sunrise. And even though maybe God only brought the sunshine for the righteous people, but once the sun comes out, it comes out for everybody. And everyone benefits, no distinctions are made between if you're righteous or not. And that's the verse, Tov Hashem Lakol. Hashem is good to everybody. Hashem does things in the world that everybody benefits from it, if they deserve it or not. <coughs> Hoeing <coughs> refers to the time when Hashem focuses attention only on the righteous. And this kindness only reaches those who are worthy of a particular kindness and anticipate that kindness, just like the healthy tree wants the farmer to take care of it. Uh, but, let's say if a person is not worthy of a particular kindness and doesn't anticipate it, then Hashem just passes by the person and moves on. And this type of kindness is called what? Tov Hashem Lekovah, on the left side. Okay? Now, there's another term we can use for this. This is what this Gemara is really telling us. There is a term regarding God's supervision of the world. Hashkocha. The Hashkocha, the Hebrew word for supervision is Hashkocha. Hashem supervision. There's one kasem called Hashkocha Klolis, which means general supervision, where Hashem generally takes care of the world. And then there's something called Hashkocha Pratis. There is private individual supervision, which is the next row, next column number three. So we've got a lot of similar terms that are going to be used that are going to be flowing down from each other. We have a concept of tov, goodness, where you see sometimes Hashem is good to everybody, some just to the righteous. Similar to the farmer who waters everything and holds only the trees that are worth it. And then that really is just hinting all to God's supervision, whether it be a general supervision or a specific supervision. Okay, we're good so far? Now, what does this Gemara really mean? So let's move on and, 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 and get a little further in this. Every Shabbos in the morning services in the Pesukah de Zimra, there is a, uh, a psalm that we say that is called the Hallel HaGadol, the big Hallel. 
And that's when it starts with the words, Hodel Hashem Kitov, Kili Alam Chasto. And then it goes on for 26 stanzas saying Hashem did this, Hashem did that, Kili Alam Chasto, Kili Alam Chasto. 26 times you say, Kili Alam Chasto, his kindness is forever. And that's called the Halal Agoro because it's very long. And it's 26 stanzas of showing Hashem is kind. His kindness is forever. So the question is, why 26? Why 26 stanzas? All right, so you could say, that's a hint of God's name. yud Hey and vav Hey comes out to 26. But the Gemara in source number 5 says, the 26 Hodus parallel the 26 generations which God created in his world and had not yet given to them the Torah, thereby sustaining them with kindness. You know, when you're in the world, God has you alive in the world, he gives it to you for free, right? What do you do to deserve it? Nothing. Well, that went on for 26 generations. For 26 generations, until God gave mankind the Torah officially, on the book. And there was a Sinai revelation where the Jews accepted upon themselves the Torah. He says, for those first 26 generations, God let us live with kindness. So the 26 is hinting. The 26 Kili Olam Chastos is hinting that there were 26 generations where it was pure kindness. Where man, so to speak, didn't do anything to deserve what God was giving him. And he couldn't, basically, because there was no Torah yet. I don't want to get into the details. I saw people knew the Torah. I don't want to go get into the details. It's just a simple explanation. So what happens? So for the first 26 generations, there was the world sustained by God, even though nobody deserved it. It was total kindness. We will call it in governmental terms, it was a welfare system. People did not earn their keep for 26 generations. They didn't do anything to make themselves deserving of living. They didn't have a Torah to follow. We'll say it was general admission into the world, just like you have in the, in the big uh, 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 sports events. It's general admission. You know, anybody can take any seat, as it were. Now you don't have that so much anymore. It used to be, you went to events, there was a general admission. First come, first serve. Nobody special, not before reserve seats, whatever. You know, no specific seats. God was kind to all 26 generations, and it wasn't really that bad in those 26 generations, as God's kindness lasts forever. Now you might think, and make a mistake and think, that wait a minute, you're saying for the first 26 generations, God was giving us everything for free. Then all of a sudden came the Torah, and the welfare program was over. And now you have to earn your keep. So you might wonder, well, what was better? 26 years of welfare generations? Or now getting a Torah, you have to earn your keep. Remember, earn your keep means you have to earn it. If you don't earn your keep, you don't get it. But of course we know that uh, the whole world was created for the purpose of the Jewish people getting the Torah at Sinai. God said to the Jews, if you don't, keep the you don't take the Torah now, I'm going to destroy the whole world. The reason I created the world is one day there would be a people who would get the Torah at Sinai. So obviously getting the Torah at Sinai was a very important event, was a good thing. But how was it good? So Rav Huttner continues and now explains two other terms as we keep moving along here. We talk about God's kindness. But there's two kinds of kindnesses of God, as you begin to see the right side of kindness and the left side of kindness on this board. And he uses two terms that I'll say once in Hebrew, but you're going to see it in English the whole time. He has a kindness of, called chesed shel vitur, which means a kindness of, literally means concession. Concession, it's like to be mavater, or we'll call it charitable kindness. So I've got the kindness of concession over there or we'll call it charitable kindness. I'll explain it in a minute. And there's another kindness called chesed shel mishpat, a kindness based on judgment. In other words, there's kindnesses we deserve and kindnesses we don't deserve. There's a justifiable kindness, which will follow certain rules, and there's a not justifiable kindness, which doesn't have very many rules. For example, we have in the laws of charity, as explained in the Shulchan Aruch, and in the Rambam, we say there are eight levels of charity. Eight levels of charity. I'm not going to go through the eight levels of charity, but let's just look at two examples. Level number one, let's say if a rich man goes to a poor man and says the following. Listen, I know you're a poor man, you're down and out, you have lots of kids. I'll tell you what. Whatever your bills are, okay, 
just bring them to me. And every day you bring me a bill, I'll pay the bill. Okay, would you say that's kindness? For sure it's kindness. You're helping the guy out. Right? That's one level of kindness. And superficially it looks great. Look, the guy doesn't have to pay anything. The guy's helping out totally. Now, uh, you know, uh, if, if, if the guy would give him a bill that he was just three weeks in the Bahamas with his family, I don't know if he would have paid the, that kind of bill. But he'd say, you know, bread, milk, uh, tuition, this, that, pay some bills, okay, that's fine. Now on another level, let's say this went on for uh, five years. Five years, the rich man says, okay, you just give me the bills, I'm going to pay for them. Then one day, the rich man says, you know, uh, I'm going to change, I'm going to change the deal a little bit. You know, you don't have to just sit around and watch TV all day long and then just go to the grocery store and give me your bills. Guess what I've done? Great news. I have found you a job. Okay? I found you a job. And the guy goes, work? Right? Yeah, work. Right? So, uh, and guess what? Now that I found you a job, I ain't going to be paying your bills anymore. And I'll even tell you something else. Uh, lately, the bills have been running up to about, I don't know, you know, six, seven thousand dollars a month. Well, guess what? This job you have pays you five thousand dollars a month. I hope you'll figure a way to make ends meet. But I found you the job, and you have the job. Now, which level of charity, according to halacha, is a higher level of charity? The second level. Why? Because until now, the poor man was sustained with out and out handout charity, vitor, concession, but now the person can earn his keep from the money that he earns. So that's what we meant when we describe, and now you see I put on the top as the heading, the first 26 generations of the world versus after Sinai. So that's what I mean, the first 26 generations, we called it a chesed shel vitor, a general um, uh, kindness of concession. So the whole world got paid and they didn't do anything to deserve it. But once the Torah is given at Sinai and the Jewish people would now have to work and earn their keep, they would receive now what kind of a payment from God? A chesed shell? Mishpat. A kindness that is justifiably coming to them. And really, it is a deepening of God's kindness. It's a more intensified kindness and not a diminished kindness at all. Because now the Jews can pay their own rent by learning Torah and doing mitzvahs as Hashem commanded them. Therefore, what do we see? There's a tremendous jump in God's kindness after the 26 generations. Because now after 26 generations with the giving of the Torah at Sinai, the Jewish people specifically and non-Jews as well, if they keep their seven Noahide laws, because at Sinai the seven Noahide laws were kind of fixed for them until Sinai things were in a state of flux weren't sure who a Jew was going to be who a non-Jew was going to ultimately be everything was in flux but Sinai sealed the deal there's one group of people called the Jews the Bnei Yisrael they have a deal with me 613 mitzvahs I pay you according to how you do the 613 mitzvahs no more free lunches and for the non-Jewish world as well for those who want to take part of the program, and they are supposed to take part of the program, you can earn your keep by doing the seven Noahide laws. That's official now. And this is a greater sense of kindness. It's a greater than a handout. And at Sinai, we were told that we could get much more now than from the 26 previous generations of Kili Olam Chasto that God was giving us handouts. So, to summarize, up to the point right now, when the Talmud in Masecha Sanhedrin, that we quoted in source number four, says that the verse that Hashem is good to everyone, what does it mean he's good to everyone? That means an undiscriminating type of kindness. It's a hashkacha klalis. It's a general supervision to the whole world. That's a kindness, a vitor, that's not discriminating. And God's just giving it. And you don't necessarily earn it. It's going to everybody. Whereas the concept of chesed shall mishpat, the kindness of justice, that pertains to the individual who justifiably earns God's kindness. That's where things have gone. And this becomes, this is the landmark difference that Sinai brought a change 
to the way that God is relating to the world. A significant, um, fundamental change. Until then, God just kept things going no matter what you were doing. Basically, with very little, a little bit of here and then, Tower of Babel knocked out the tower, the flood brought the flood. But it was just, you know, when things got really bad, he just, he didn't have a choice. But, it, but you know, you want to have a good day? You don't have to do much to do a good day. If you, only if you're really bad, I'll take it away from you. But you don't have to do anything to earn your keep. God said, that has to change. People have to start earning their keep. This is what it really was all about. And we're going to see, as we go ahead, things change greatly. The whole setup of man's relationship with God changes at Sinai. Now you've got to remember, Sinai is the end result of the beginning where the Jews leaving Mitzrayim. And that's what you're going to see as we develop. The Jews in this time is getting us to this point. This is the point we're trying to get to. Because when Hashem said to Moshe, in this week's parsha, the four expressions of redemption, four expressions. So one is to stop the backbreaking work. Another was to, uh, you know, the, the, the exactly what it means, but one is uh, being a slave at all. Third is leaving me trying. But the fourth expression of redemption was, and you will be my people. I will give you the Torah. So that was the fourth level of, of redemption. So we're building up to something beautiful over here. So we have to see how this all fits in over here. So now, now we've developed this. Now I have to ask a question. Let's look at the two kindnesses. The kindness of concession, that's undiscriminating kindness, and the kindness of justice. Let's focus now on the next point. Where is the spotlight? When you talk about chesed shalvitor, where Hashem gives kindness on a concessional basis, unwarranted, who is the spotlight focused on? The giver or the receiver? The, the fact that a person is getting something from another person, what is the real focus? It's on the giver. The focus on the giver, why? Because the giver is a charitable superstar. The guy gives, even though he's not giving anything in return, he's amazing. He's going to pay somebody else's bills. The poor man happens to be the lucky recipient. But if it wasn't this poor man, it'd be another poor man. The star of the show is the giver, because he's the person who's really doing things over here. Right? So, the essential characteristic of charitable kindness is that the act of giving is taking place, and it really doesn't matter who the receiver is, because the receiver is undeservant. If the receiver is undeserving, so where's the spotlight on? Not on the undeserving guy. He didn't do anything to deserve it. It's the one who gives, even though he's not getting anything in return. The recipient, more than that, has no real standing. He has no real stature. That's like when we were watering all the trees in the orchard. When you're watering all the trees in the orchard, who's the spotlight on? It's the, the farmer who's irrigating the whole orchard. The wonderful farmer who has enough water to irrigate the entire orchard. And in one fell swoop, he waters the entire orchard, and they all benefit. And in this way, similarly, the world is filled with God's kindness. He's kind to everyone. Tov Hashem Lako. When Hashem is good to everybody, and He's giving a general watering, and He's giving to everybody, and the sun comes up for everybody, no matter what, that is Tov Hashem Lako. And the spotlight is clearly on Hashem. Correct. Now it's interesting, as a little side point, the mystics tell us that everything that happens in this world has, has a mystical origin. And even if we talk about politics, it's a reflection of what's going on in the heavenly realm, in one extent or another. So, like, th these are spiritual, I'm giving you a spiritual formulas here. These are spiritual formulas, the way God runs the world. You have a formula of Tov Hashem Lakol. Hashem is good to everybody. That means He's watering the whole field. That's a general supervision. Doesn't matter who you are. The focus on the giver. The giver is the one who's amazing over here. Versus, on the other hand, another system. Well, this godly system really is the spiritual root for what we would call socialism. Where do you think somebody gets in their mind to make, where does a person have an idea to have socialism? Because there's a spiritual kernel of that in the creation. How God deals with the world. If God gives everybody, even though they don't deserve, he gives, everybody's the same. So that's really a socialistic welfare state that unfortunately ended in communism. 
But what did the government say? What was the theory, at least? I'm not saying what happened. But what's the theory? The theory is, government says, we're going to take care of all your needs. All you have to do is be a good comrade, be a good member of the proletariat, be a good worker, and Mother Russia will end up watering all the fields. We'll take care of everybody. Everyone's going to receive the same benefits. That was the theory. Right? Again, and now who's the focus on? Who's the focus on? Focus on Mother Russia. <clears throat> the focus on the giver, right? And therefore, in this case, the leaders of the government. Right? And communism was coming to the aid of the worker who was so alienated because of his loss of jobs because of the Industrial Revolution. So individuals were lost on the assembly line. There was no such thing as pride in somebody's work. The worker was a nobody. So communists like Marx and Engel, they come along to restore the honor of the individual worker. How? By making him totally and completely dependent on the government. Right? Everybody got the same apartment. And, you know, same salary. And in China, many, many years ago, everybody had dressed the same. Many years ago, they all had dressed the same. Can you imagine going in Maya Sharim, going to a dry cleaners and trying to pick up a black suit, you know? <laughs> the same thing, right? Unfortunately, communism didn't live up to its promise. It was a horrible distortion of what charitable kindness was supposed to be. But that's where that theory is. You know, that's the theory. So socialism, per se, is based in Tov Hashem Lakom. It's really a godly system, but unfortunately human beings make it go awry. It's interesting, the irony, the irony of this was, who ended up losing their status completely through communism? It was the receivers. It, it ended up, the individuals wound up losing everything, and the government interfered with every single thing they wanted. It didn't work out that way, but that's a side. Okay, that's the right side. But let's look at the other hand. If we look at Chesed Shel Mishpat, if we look at kindness that's by justice, by law, justifiable kindness. Whenever kindness is earned, who is the spotlight on then? The giver or the receiver? The receiver. Because he's earned it. He rolls up his sleeve. He works hard. He gets what he deserves. And in the analogy of the orchard, where the farmer hoes the tree, right, that's doing okay, so in other words, the tree that's making the effort to grow properly and working hard to survive, the farmer sees that the tree is trying and therefore he tends to it and he hoes it. And that's the example of Tov Hashem Lekovav. Hashem is good to those who seek Him, who try to earn their keep. So there's a fundamental difference on who the focus is on. If it's a generic kindness to everybody, then there's no focus on anybody except God. But if the focus is, if it's a kindness of justice, where you have to deserve what you get, then everybody becomes important. The spotlight is on the person who earns his way. And this, this mystical orientation is the source of what political system? Capitalism. Capitalism was founded by, on the idea that everyone's supposed to function according to this principle. The idea of capitalism was that everyone have a chance to work and be rewarded based on a free market system. Your efforts of hard work, the harder you work, the more money you're going to make. That's a capitalistic society. A great theory again. All right? But this too has been distorted because there's a lot of problems with their system. <laughs> we do people who can't work. You know, there is a problem. There are people who cannot work. A lot of people don't want to work. Well, that messes up the system. If everyone was healthy and honest and wanted to work, perhaps the system would work. But there are human factors that present tremendous challenges to capitalism. So, but this again, you see, capitalism and socialism are really just political manifestations of the way God runs the world. That's what it is. That's the root. And in capitalism, it basically, you know, you can debate the point, was the individuals who messed up the system, and communism is the government who messed up the system. So communism, whereas the giver is supposed to focus is on the giver, fine, so the givers messed up the system. Capitalism, the focus is on the receiver, the earners, and the earners messed up the system, right? You know, when, when you go and, 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 and buy something from somebody, you sell something to somebody, and he's paying $10,000 for it, and you give him garbage that isn't worth it, and a guy who has no recourse of claiming it, you've messed up the system. And when you pay off the, the police to not enforce the laws, then you've really messed up the system, and the people making up the laws, making those laws, even makes it worse. 
But in theory, in theory, okay, so I'm just trying to get you these ideas. There's God's, there's God's socialistic way of dealing with people and God's capitalistic way of dealing with people. Okay? So now, I think that's pretty clear now. The mechanism of chesed shall mishpat, every person is looking and wait, wanting and waiting to earn by rolling up his sleeves and doing his efforts. And these two systems have basically described the center of the world. Now, what happened when the Jewish people got the Torah? What makes getting the Torah such an amazing event for us as Jews? Well, what happened is Hashem created with that giving the Torah the distinct face of the individual receiver. That's what happened. The Almighty lifted up the heads of the Jewish people and gave each individual his own face as opposed to what the world was like beforehand. Before the giving of the Torah, the world was a bunch of faceless masses. Just a bunch of people out there. And it was sustained, why? Because God's kind. He watered the whole orchard, irrespective if one tree stood out better or not. But once the Torah was given, God gave everyone, so to speak, a face. The individual earns his keep, who was no longer a faceless person. And that's what makes Sinai such a seminal event in Jewish history. It was a sign that each person, God gave each person a face, individually, where they can have self-respect and earn their own living. And that's where we move on to the next issue. Everything's fitting in nicely here. You got the government, and they got the people. Are the people faceless masses or the face of an earner? And at Sinai, I said, I'm going to change your persona. You're not a faceless mass, part of a faceless mass. You're the face of an earner. Okay, now, let's come back to the morale that we started with. So, what is the greatness in Hashem performing an action which is at one time miraculous for one individual and a natural occurrence for another individual? What's so great about it? Well, the morale said that this act reveals wondrous things about Hashem. He's able to do a miracle for one who needs the miracle to happen to him, and at the same time he maintains the natural order for another, and that's a much greater miracle than God doing a comprehensive miracle. So we're going to see, based on what we're saying in one second, how this all fits into place over here. We have to say one more source to put all the pieces together. So let's look at source number six. When God created the first human being, when God created the world, he created many, many trees, many, many flowers, many, many horses, many, many donkeys, many animals, many insects, many fish, many of everything. When it came to creating the human being, human race, how many did he make on the first cut? One. Why did he make one? So the Gomorrah and Sanhedrin offers many answers, and one of the answers they gave was that, source six, therefore man was created singly, Therefore, each and every one is obligated to see, to say, Bishvili Nivra Olam, for me, the world was created. We look and say, God created a whole world for one man, for Adam. That was it. Everything was created in the world. It was all worth it for one man. To teach us that every human being has to look at the world the same way. That Hashem created the whole world, even if there was nobody else in this world, God forbid, it would still be worth it for Hashem to create the world for me. So what does that mean? What does that mean exactly? Now, there's a wrong way to learn that. Though it's for me, I can selfishly use whatever I want. The whole world's for me. I can do what I want. I don't care about anybody else. It's all for me. That's the wrong way to understand that. But let's see how this logic works. When millions of people get up in the morning and the sun gets up every morning, what do you say to yourself when you see the sun in the morning? You get up. It's a hard day to wish it would be a sunny day today. When you look up and you see the sun is, 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 is shining, do you say to yourself, wow, look how kind God is to me? Probably not. You're thinking, you know what? The sun is shining for everybody. The sun shines every day, regardless who I am. I'm really a worthless nobody. Probably the sun, if it is shining for anybody, is shining for this big tzaddik somewhere who deserves to enjoy the warmth of the sun. But it's certainly not shining for me but uh, because it's shining in Toronto, so incidentally, I'm one of the I'm one of the cast, I'm one of the faceless masses over here, so I get a little bit of sunshine too, because there's that hashkacha klolis, that general supervision, and I'm part of that general supervision. That's not the way a Jew is supposed to think. The reason why man was created as an individual was to reveal to each and every one of us 
that each and every one of us is a separate person who is worthy of an entire universe, not just the sun. Now, you being is supposed to say that, you know what, the sun came out today for me and only me. If I was the only person on the planet, Hashem would bring the sun up for me, just like he did it for the first man. And therefore you have to say also that the water flows and the atmosphere is sustained and the cows give milk and everything that's going on in this world, everything God created was for me. And that's how you're supposed to feel. Now why? I'm going to see in one second. Now there's a big difference. When, when you feel, there's a big difference as, if, as to whether you feel I'm really important. I'm important, not arrogant. I'm important that God did this for me, for the work that I have to do versus a person who feels I'm just part of the, the, the faceless masses. When you believe you're part of the faceless masses, you lose your individuality, your sense of self, and the Talmud is saying you've got to remember that the world was created just for you and that you're very important. Now, this may be very difficult for people to accept and it probably was difficult for the Jewish people in Egypt to believe. And this was the transition that had to begin. Right? You have to think about it in your own life. Do you really think you're that important that God makes the sunrise for you? Do you think I'm really nothing? In the scope of things, I'm nothing. And he brings it, you know, for the whole world. Maybe for the good people he brings it. For me, to, you know, I, 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 if I wasn't here, it wouldn't make a difference in God's scheme of things. I have nothing to contribute to this world. Right? So, certainly, it was very hard for the Jew. Right? Now, here's the point. What happens when God brought the first plague? Now, let's be clear what this first plague was. Let's look at it very clearly. At the very same time that nature was continuing in its path, giving water for the Jew, a miracle was happening simultaneously that the Egyptian was drinking blood. Okay, that, that was the miracle. Now, today, today, none of us really feels that we're the first man, right? Today, today there's no such thing as the lonely single person. We live in a world with billions, what's now, seven billion people? Six plus seven billion, whatever. It's a tremendous amount of people, right? It's hard to say that God created the whole world just for me, like the first man, right? So when can a little person feel that the whole world was created just for him? What would it have to take it? for you and I to believe the whole, God created the whole world just for me? Well, the answer is if God would do a miracle that works simultaneously with nature rather than a miracle that goes across the board for everybody. And I'll explain this. If God does a miracle across the board, right? No one's going to think the miracle is just of them. Let's go, let's go further on in the story. In two weeks, God splits the sea. Okay, now who goes through the sea? The entire Jewish people go through the Sea of Reeds. It was a miracle. Now, was that a miracle for individuals? It was a group miracle. Every Jew experienced the miracle. And what's the miracle? That they went through the sea. Now, what do you think if you were a Jew going through the sea while the water is on both sides there? What were you thinking at that moment? They were probably thinking, the Jews said, you know, I sure hope God isn't looking at me right now. I hope he's not focused on me because if he's looking right at me, he would drown me like he's going to drown the Egyptians in five minutes because I'm no better than the Egyptians. That's what the Jew is going through the, 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 the water at that point says, I sure hope God's not looking at me because I ain't that great of a person. And they probably want to cover their, their face and get the other side before God noticed them and then crush the water in on them. You know, I better sneak in. He didn't notice I came in. Maybe he, he, the Jewish people are going in. <laughs> the whole people. Yeah, Moshe's leading us in. But it's good there's a lot of us and I can kind of go under the radar as it were. I'm going to get through before God even noticed me back. That's what happens whenever we are recipients of God's general kindness. That's that Hashgacha Kali, that general supervision. When a group miracle happens, we feel that God loves the Jewish people as a whole. But he doesn't necessarily love little old me. The fact that Jewish people have survived three and a half thousand years of Jewish history makes you maybe feel good that the Jewish people are noticed by God, but doesn't necessarily feel that you are noticed by Hashem. 
and you might like being part of such a club, but you're still, even when there's only 14 million of us, you're still an insignificant nobody in that club. That's what you think. However, when a miracle happens within the context of nature, when you're drinking the very same jug with an Egyptian, and at the very same time when you're drinking water, not six million Jews together are drinking from one jug, but I'm on my own individual jug drinking water, and it's a mystery drinking my own individual drinking, and you're getting water and he's getting blood. What must you have to admit for the first time in your life? That the sun is shining only for me. God separated the one who needed the miracle and the one who didn't need the miracle. And God singled out the Jew. Each, and that, that was the uniqueness of the plague of blood. Every Jew walked out after that week and said, you know, God's paying a lot of attention to me. Not to the Jewish people in general, to me. Because me, with the Egyptian, we're drinking at the same time, and God made sure that I got the water and he got the blood. And that's what the morale is saying when a miracle and nature are working simultaneously. Two opposites in one container, what the morale is saying, that's a bigger miracle. We need to say, you experience for the first time in your life a super duper private miracle that God is doing just for you. And for the first time, those Jews, who remember, these are Jews, imagine a Jew in a concentration camp. That's what it was like being in Egypt. Not just for six years, but for a, a hundred years plus. And you're born in a concentration camp. You gave birth to children in a concentration camp. And all you know is, you know, you know, there's all of us are stuck here. So the first, and can, so the first time a Jew could say with a, with a full heart, Bishvili Nivra Olam. The world was created just for me. It wasn't a general miracle for everybody, in which, but rather, where each individual happened to be part of the group. It was a miracle that was so accurate and individualized in its manifestation that any Jew could not help but notice God's special providence in the life. That's the breakthrough of this, of this miracle of blood. You with me? And that's what happened throughout many of the plagues. So at this point, the Jews are going to begin the transition from the realm of charitable kindness, because we're all part of one mass, and they're beginning to take their first step towards freedom, the first step towards Sinai. At this point, the Jew is being made to be felt worthy. He is being introduced to feel as a concept of Tov Hashem Lekovav. Hashem is kind to those who anticipate Him. Because why? Hashem is saying to every Jew with this first plague of blood, I love you. Specifically, you. Not just because you're part of the group. It's you who I watched. It's you who I was taking care of. And you can't deny that I wasn't paying attention to you specifically. And the first plague is the beginning to show us a transition from slavery and a lack of self-worth to a realization that the whole world was created for me. Right? Hashem is saying that, you know, I know you can daven, I know you can serve me, I know you can receive the Torah at Sinai, and because of that I'm going to show you that the whole world exists just for you. And you no longer have to live with that embarrassing feeling of being a faceless entity amongst the general masses getting general kindness and handouts from the rich man. Hashem is saying, I'm attending to your individual needs like the farmer who goes and hoes the trees that are deservant of it. And it was the first plague where the Jew was suddenly transported back to the world of the first man before he sinned. Because that's how it was. The first man before he sinned clearly knew the whole world was created for him. Clearly knew that. Unfortunately, when you sin, you get all sorts of problems. You forget that whole message. But it was that point that, that every Jew felt he was created, that the whole world was created for him, and that Hashem was tampering with all the rules of nature just for him as he was drinking the water while the non-Jew was drinking the blood. So the recognition of God's specific supervision was an absolute necessary condition that had to exist in the process of the exodus of a Jew. This is, a very, this is the point of the whole class. 
A Jew has to realize that he has hashkocha pratis from Hashem. He has detailed supervision. Hashem watches every step you take. And this was a change. It, the world now changed. When we were before the plague of blood, clearly God was seeing all the Jews in one fell swoop. That's the way it was. It really was that way. Because it couldn't be any different. The Jew didn't have the tools to deal with a focus on him. No Torah yet. But now Hashem is saying, no, I want you to know. You know, you want to be a free person. This freedom is based on a few factors. And the first one is you've got to clearly know that I am watching everything you're doing. So the Exodus really marks the beginning of a new world order that would soon be formalized with the giving of the Torah. Once the Torah was given, the Exodus experience would reach its end. The Exodus experience marked the end of 26 generations of gratuitous kindness and the beginning of what we will call the Tzuras Ha'adam, the shape of the human being. The real human being could get up and say, the world was created for me. The Exodus marked the creation of a Jew who was worthy of receiving. A Jew who tore himself away from the welfare state of life that exists in Egypt and the first plague marked the beginning of that redemption. Therefore, it had to be the first plague would be one that was mixed, nature and not nature. So the Jew himself could see clearly, he could not deny that Hashem had his finger right on him. And that's a very important thing. That's a very important thing to, to, to understand. So, just let's go back now. Remember he said the story, just like the poor man who initially was getting handouts for five years. And what do you think he does the first day the guy, the, the nice guy says, I found you a job. Okay, and initially he probably resented it, right? You know, you have certain government programs, I don't know in Canada, but in the United States, I know for sure, right? There's certain uh, work programs they have that at the end of the day, you, you make less than if you're on welfare, right? If you're on welfare, you get X, right? They get, they get you a job, but to get the job means, number one, you, you need a modes of transportation. So that costs money. If you have kids, you have to have babysitters. And by the time you figure it all out, you have to wear nicer clothes, you go to work, can't just go in your shmatas, right? At the end of the day, persons figure, I make more working for the, uh, getting the government, giving me a handout that's not worth me getting a job. So initially, people, you know, don't want to get involved, right? So what did God have to do? But God was going to make this, this change was happening. And, there was, and you're going to see in a minute why. There was a lot of resistance to this. You know, go, go into the slums of, of the world and people are used to not working, used to getting handouts and knowing they have no self-esteem, okay? And they're like an animal. You just punch in, get your food stamps or whatever, your welfare card, and you get it. I'm nobody important. I say, no, you're going to start working for a living. They say, what? I can't. I'm not able. I'm a nothing. I'm a garnished. Right? So God had to coerce the Jews to get this Torah. It wasn't so simple. Getting the Torah meant everything. The system's changing. T take the, take the, uh, the, uh, the impoverished person who's used to living the first way, has no self-esteem, no self-worth, and say, now you're responsible. What are you going to do? I say, nah, I can't do that. That's not for me. But that's what Sinai exactly was. Shashem has to, has to build them up. He just can't just give them the Torah like that. It's going to be a little build-up to this. They're reluctant to go. You see this, you know, in adolescence, sometimes a lot of kids, uh, you know, are terrified to go out on their own. They're not used to it. Others, if they hate their family, then they're happy to go on their own, right? But the key is that the idea that the Almighty's eyes are upon you is the beginning of redemption. If you really want to feel like you're a free person, you have to believe that Hashem is totally focused. Why? Because if you want to remove the shackles of the smallness of being a person who, who uh, and be able to come to a level that you uh, can lift up your head and sense that Hashem is looking directly at you, then you have to realize that Hashem is taking care of you personally. You have to understand that. If you think that God's supervision is a general supervision meant for the whole world, and you know, if you believe that, then my friends, you've opened up a wonderful trap door which you can fall into and come through every Avera in the book. Every sin in the book. If you think that all Hashem does is look at the world in a general way, you open yourself up to the worst behaviors possible. You think you can go through the sea of reeds without God even noticing you. You can just as well believe 
that you can do a horrible sin and God won't notice you because he doesn't look at the little details. He looks at just giving the sun for the whole day or the rain for the whole day. He doesn't look at every little detail. Right? You catch somebody doing something wrong. And you say to them, why are you doing this thing that's wrong? So what are they going to say? Well, my friends do much worse than what I do. So what's so bad what I'm doing? And the person can say that, you know, you know, you can only say that if you feel that the world is general admission. That God waters the whole world. He's not really noticing what I'm doing. He's not noticing what my friends are doing. He's not noticing what I'm doing. Right? So you know, think about it. Think about yourself. At times when you've done things you shouldn't have done. Think of a time when you really did something you should not have done it. Besides the general excuses of temptation, we still have to justify why we did it. Even if you say, well, I did it because I was angry. I did it because I was lustful. I did it for this. That's only the, you know, that's the first step. But, but, but you know, you're not supposed to do it even though you, did. you are lustful. You're not supposed to do it even though you are tempted. You're still not supposed to do it. So how does a person rationalize ever doing an error? How do you rationalize it? The only way to be able to justify your actions is to say, Hashem really doesn't pay attention to the mitzvahs that I'm doing, so he probably doesn't pay attention to my sins either. A person can delude himself into thinking that the sun shines for the general population only. And if it's going to be a rainy day, it's going to be a rainy day for everybody too. So the person lives under the illusion that there is nobody noticing him. I'll give you another example. Let's say you come to shul and you see some people talking in shul. They're talking in shul during Davani. Now if God would ask them, right, how do you expect to get a reward for coming to shul even though you're not saying one word to me? Right? How do you expect it? What are they going to answer? Oh God, I don't know, but you know, you see the guy down the bench over there? He talks ten times as much as me, and I see he got his check this week. And I don't talk half as much as him. I'm certainly going to get the check as well. In other words, you're not really paying a lot of attention. Look on the show. See, the biggest talkers are the richest guys in the community. <laughs> they talk the whole time during them. They're getting paid. He's getting paid. So if he's getting paid, I can get paid. That's why we don't think our missus are so meaningful. And if we think our mitzvahs aren't so meaningful, then what do you think about your averus? Right? So that depends on what's your, what's your, uh, what's your focus. That's why we're having trouble with all these other things. So, what do we learn from this first plague? The first plague in which the Jew was picked out individually, what do we see? Is that the answer to redemption begins with the Jew who can absorb the feeling that Hashem is looking at us. That's what redemption depends on. He's tending to you as that specific tree. Right? That's a transition from a national identity to an individually identity. And the first step was with this first plague. And at that point, each Jew is beginning to realize that Hashem is focusing on him. And each Jew realized that, that he would have to start earning his keep. And that's why 80% of the Jews did not want to go out of Egypt. Because 80% would rather say, I'm, not, I'm uncomfortable with that attention that you're giving me. I'm not interested in that responsibility. I'm not interested in earning my keep. I'm not interested in you focusing on what I have. And therefore I can do whatever I want. You see, there's a very liberal, liberal idea. Those who are atheists are very, not just atheists, they want to be free people. Because an atheist has a tremendous luxury, which means nothing I do really matters. Doesn't matter. There's nobody really who told me what to do. I don't have to answer to anybody. And there's no such thing as anything ever being wrong. And that's a great way of copping out of life. And whatever happens is going to happen. You enjoy your life. You know, when, when the world blows up, it'll blow up and I'll be part of it. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Then I'll just keep living out my life and that's it. And that and that's the trap. That's the trap, right? The process. This, this is a process. That first plague, every Jew could not deny. Can't you know that Hashem is looking right at you? So therefore, what happens at the end? What happens at the end? Right before they go out of Egypt, what did God tell every head of a household to do? The last thing before they left Egypt. What did they have to do? They had to go and take the lamb of Egypt, which was considered their god in front of the Egyptian and take it and say I'm going to slaughter your lamb and kill it because God told me to do this 
This wasn't a, a group. It wasn't like one. It's not a Corbin uh, Seabor where it's a, it's a sacrifice for the entire country. It wasn't one lamb for all the Jews. It's a very unique Corbin. This is the one, only time in history where it was a totally individualized, not even within the confines of the Beis Amigdash. Every Jew took the lamb in for his little family in front of the Egyptians and each family had to, on its own, assert itself, put their life on the line, take that Paschal offering, smear the blood on the doorposts, and only that Jew was able to survive the 10th plague. Because the Jew had to say, I'm singled out. The other Jews who didn't, the 80% who didn't, right, who didn't, who, they didn't, they didn't leave. They said, we want to be part of the faceless masses. God says, I got, nothing, I got no patience for the faceless masses anymore. Faceless masses, goodbye. The ones who said, I, I'm, I'm going to take on this incredible challenge of being spotted and noted by you, is the one who goes out. Right? That is a big difference. And that really, um, we basically covered the entire chart over here. You see, point eight, the miracle, the miracle is everywhere to everybody. That doesn't still give you any individuality. If you've got a miracle with nature, meaning to say God says you are different than him, he has the blood, you don't have the blood, and you say Hashem is noticing me. And now that now makes a big difference in terms of God's love, which is the last point. What do you think about God's love? Does God love the Jewish people in, the, in general? Or does he love me? It's a big difference, isn't it? That, that's, that's, that's how people feel in, in a lot of ways. You know, people feel, oh, do you think the teacher, the teacher loves the whole class? Or does he love each individual of the class? That means what kind of connection you're going to have. If you think the teacher likes the whole class, well, it doesn't really matter what I do. Right? He says, but, but, but if he loves me, you can imagine a kid want, kids want to fool around in class, right? And the teacher was really nice to one kid. He noticed again, oh, I noticed, Slimy, you're not happy as anything. The matter, can I help you? Yeah, I lost my lunch money. Oh, don't worry, here, here's five dollars, here's some lunch money. Well, what, now, the, what does the kid think? Oh, the Rebbe noticed me, he loves me. Now, the kid class is going to all make a prank on the teacher. You think that kid's going to make a prank on the teacher? He doesn't feel like he's the faceless masses anymore. He's, he's, Hashem noticed me, Hashem loves me, Hashem loves me. How can I not do what he wants? Right? Now, certainly, God does not speak to us and we don't have these, uh, the benefit of these plagues. I mean, Halabai, Hashem says this a little bit and often, right? That every bad person drinks blood. This week, if to this week every bad person drank blood and every good Jew got a glass of water instead, you know, oh, Hashem is noticing me, right? But, uh, but, but uh, the truth is, if we keep our eyes open, we'll see that Hashem is sending us messages all the time. We just have to work a little harder in understanding the messages. You know, I'll say for one example. Now let's think of today, um, Tuesday, January 17th, the year 2012. What are the majority of people in the world doing at this time right now? Either working, or if they're not working, trying a way, trying to find a way to fill up their meaningless lives with something to do. Right? And here, you got about 15 people who are learning Torah. <laughs> Now, you got to look in the scheme of life, you guys are very weird in terms of most people don't do what you're doing at this point in time. You ask most people, what do you do at 10.30 on a Tuesday morning? Oh, I got squash, I got this, I got that. Why would I be learning Torah? Right? The fact that you're learning Torah today can only be because Hashem has touched your life in a very personal way. Now, you have to go back, do a little backtracking to find that out. As we know, uh, I believe it was Rabbi Nachman said, I could be wrong, but I think it was Rabbi Nachman said, you know, what are the odds, what are the odds of you being an, a, a, a from Jew who's learning Torah? Think about it, what are the odds? Now, there's seven billion people in the world, right? What are the odds that you came into the world to be a Jew and not a non-Jew, first of all? What are the odds? If you figure out the fractions, 14 million over seven billion, you come up with the decimal point. 0.000001% chance that you would be a Jew? Okay, that's first chance, right? Second chance, okay, you're a Jew. Okay, now, from the 40 million Jews, how many Jews even believe in God? Right? Maybe half? So there's a 50 chance you're going to lose on that one too, right? Then how many Jews are observant Jews? 
How many Jews are How many of all the people in the world today are learning Torah at this minute? How many on the planet? Okay, let's take the thousands that are in a lake with Kolo and a mere yeshiva. I mean, how many can it be already? How many can it be? Let's say, I'm exaggerating, let's say 200,000 people. Let's say. That might, that's probably high. I'm not my kids who are in school and have to be in school. That doesn't count. I'm talking about an adult who has a free will choice to do what he wants to do. How many are learning Torah at this point in time? So you tell me the number, 200,000 over 7 billion. Do you tell me that God didn't pick your number, pick your number straight out? Right? So, uh, you may not see the splitting of the sea, but God surely had to split a lot of seas to get you to walk into this building today. And you say, well, I never thought about that. Well, start. No, think. No, how, well, you think about that. You know, you really have to think about that. How did I end up over here? How did I end up over here? You know, wasn't my doing. Wasn't my doing. My parents were Holocaust survivors. All my, 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 my parents' relatives were Holocaust survivors. None of them sent their children to a, a religious day school in the 1950s and 60s, except my parents. What did I do to make that happen? Not me. What did my parents even do? They were lucky that the rabbi bugged them a lot and they listened to him. Why? Who knows why? I have cousins who are much different, much different than I am. Totally different. Okay? I could have been one of them. If I, my soul would have gone to my aunt, I would have been somewhere across, halfway across the world, not keeping any Yiddish guy. So Hashem didn't pick me straight in his finger right on me. And then when certain things happened in my life, Hashem made sure that that person was there to talk to me, to convince me to go to yeshiva and not to go to university at when I left high school, or whatever. Every, there's always one here, one there, and it just happened. You don't think about it. You don't think I should just pick you right out of the, out of the, right out. He picked you out and says, you, you, I'm putting you here. I noticed you, you're important. So for that alone, you should know that Hashem loves you. Ah, he's giving you trouble. It's a little hard to make parnasa. It's a little hard to make parnasa. You have this little problem, that little problem. But, but you're Jewish and you're here learning Torah today. Right? You know, so, so tomorrow morning, when you wake up in the morning, you say, Bore or Uvare Choshech. Hashem created, Yotze or Uvare Choshech. Hashem created a light. You've got to realize, He created a light just for you. Right? And the check that God writes was, is for you. Right? And, and that key idea to get in our head, that God cares for us as individuals, that's the beginning of the way to get us out of our smallness and enter the state of the first man who understands that both mitzvahs and averis are extremely meaningful to us. Either you feel you're on welfare, or you feel you're on a work program and get exactly paid for the job that you do. How do you feel as a Jew that you are? That's the beginning of redemption. If you really watch the tzaddik on Yom Kippur, if you would really keep your eyes on a tzaddik, a tzaddik on Yom Kippur, and you see that he is crying real tears and screaming to Hashem, why? Because he knows that Hashem is really listening and watching to everything he's doing. And he knows that his life is on the line. And everybody else in shul is kibitzing. It's a nice dress you have on there. The rabbi's speech was interesting. Blah, 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 blah. I, oh, it's been a long series. One o'clock already. I have to go to sleep. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's a World Series going on at this time. We can catch it over there as well, etc., etc. Right? How many of you lose sleep over God's judgment? Right? So now, question. Very good. So how can we make the fact of God's personal involvement with us more real to ourselves? So what's a practical way to do this? Very simple. Talk to Hashem. Talk to Hashem. The more you talk to Hashem, the more real in your mind His presence is going to be. And you have to make time during the day to talk to Hashem. I'm not saying davening. I mean, davening you have to do. So davening is not a choice. God says you got to daven. you got to daven three times a day. Okay, fine. I'm, uh, uh, certainly you should go to Dauphin, for sure. But beyond that, you have to talk to Hashem. You have to talk to Hashem. Rav Victor Miller of Blessed Memory said, there's, you know, there's certain things, if you want to be a great person, he gives a list of ten things to do. The, a great Jew does these ten things often. So what he says, once a day, he says, when no one's around, he says, make sure to do it when no one's around, because if someone's around, they're going to think you're crazy. He says, when no one's around, you say with the most emotional voice you could drum up, and you say, you say, Hashem, I love you. Right? 
do that once a day. Now be honest, you don't have to tell me when was the last time you said it the way I just said it. And I don't mean, you know, after you won the lottery, you say, oh, Hashem, I love you. And I mean, you know, after you had a tough day, the kids were rough and tough and tumble, and, uh, and, and some clients canceled out on you, and this and that, and, and, and uh, you got late and hung up in traffic, you know, and then at the end of the day, you're tired, and you just go, Hashem, I love you. Okay? Then you know what that does? That makes you conscious of that reality that, that exists. That exists. That's the difference. That's what Hashem is saying. Now the truth of the matter is, okay, it's late already. The truth of the matter is, that's really what, uh, when Hashem gave us the Torah, were the very first words He said. Anochi Hashem Eloikecha. I am the Lord, your God. In the singular tense. Not an hash, uh, 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 Anochi Hashem Elokechem. I am your, in the plural, there's, in Hebrew, your plural and your singular. He didn't say, Anochi Hashem Elokechem. I am your, you know, your God of the six million Jews, the 600,000 Jews. Anochi Hashem Elokecha. I am your person, first person. I am your God. Can you imagine the Jews are, can you imagine, you know, when the, let's say, let's say you're in a, in a football stadium, right? You're, you're in the, whatever, the Sky Dome. <coughs> I'm going to the Sky Dome. 60,000 people? I'm not people in the Sky Dome, right? You guys are getting the public announcing system. He goes, he goes, Yossi! You hear the voice, Yossi! I mean you! You! <laughs> Me? <laughs> There's 60,000 people. No, you, I'm talking to you, man! Can you imagine? There's, there, there's 600,000 Jews sitting at the, standing at the mountain there with kids and wives. There's 3 million people. And, and, and they're hearing, and they're all there. Can you imagine three million people? And Hashem says, you, I'm your God. And every Jew felt the finger pointing right at them. I am your God. I'm not God of the Jewish people alone. I'm your God. Can you imagine? You know, even, even, even when, you, when you're in shul, you know, and, and, and there's sometimes that people are talking, you know, but when the rabbi gives you the dead eye stare, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll look at the general audience. You know, I'm looking at the general audience. But, but then when I, I go, I go. Mm. And, then, and then the guy realizes he's looking right at me. <laughs> you, you backed out. At least if you have a little bit of shame. You, but there's other people I look right at them, they just keep talking anyway. And that's bachlal. But, but generally, you know, it, it, you know you, or in school, when there's a kid, you know, it's a kid talking, I just will stop and you give him the dead eye stare. You know what I'm saying? Just look at him right like that. Okay. Stops, right? So you can imagine when Hashem gave the Torah, when He said, Anocha Hashem Elokecha, it was like He gave everybody that, 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 that look. And everybody Jew felt, He's talking right to me. And that's why when we were at Sinai, the Medrash says that every Jew was given two crowns. Each Jew was given a crown specifically, two crowns to show how individual they were. That, and that they understood. And that's, people make a mistake and they think that if you're religious, you lose your self-esteem, you lose your identity, you lose your freedom. And they're so foolish, it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. You know that Hashem is looking right at you. And He's not looking right at you to punish you. You've got to remember, He's not looking at you to punish you. He's looking at you to shower His love upon you specifically. And He wants to see what you're doing that warrants even more love from Him. He's the person, not the person, He's the God who is looking to catch you doing things that are right and to reward you for every single beautiful thing you have done. That's what He's looking at all the time. And of course, He is greatly disappointed when you don't live up to that. Because He loves you so much, He's greatly disappointed to that. I am sure that when you go to your children's rehearsals, or let's say you go to a graduation in a huge university, where they're maybe graduating four or five thousand people at a time, right? And they're all somehow up at that, I mean, these huge commencement ceremonies, right? And then when, they, when, when, when your kid's walking by amongst thousands, your eyes are only on one person. And they're all wearing the same silly uh, caps, right? They're all Hasidim when they're at a graduation. I don't know how a Hasid di different. People say Hasidim dress foolishly. And at graduation, it's stupider than a Hasid with a little tassel hanging from the side. Michigan, ooh, that's, that's a university. That's Hashiv. If a Hasid dressed like a Shabbos, I think he's a weirdo. 
I don't understand. I guess maybe you paid a hundred thousand dollars in a kid's education, whatever he dresses up is fine. <laughs> but when you're saying you go, no, who's looking at who? You're you're looking at your kid. And believe it or not, I'm sure you can pick out your kid, even with everyone looks the same. No, Hashem, you're Hashem's kid. You don't think he's looking at you the same way? But that's what freedom means. Freedom means you have to believe that Hashem is focused on you. Freedom means that what you do makes a difference. And that's the good and one other thing, a good time for this is Shabbos. Shabbos is a tremendous thing because you look in the Lecha Do Di prayer that we say every Friday night. One of the lines is Korva El Nafshi Ge'olah Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Every Friday night you ask Hashem give me freedom. Come close to me. Draw my soul near to you and I will experience some freedom. On Shabbos, you try to feel that sense of redemption. You want to feel all week long when you're, you know, in a rush hour traffic down Bathurst Street with another, you know, 100,000 meaningless, faceless, upset, grouchy um, uh, rush hour traffickers who are all stuck in the same rain. You don't feel like anything special. On Shabbos, you recapture that feeling at least when you're in your own house and you can appreciate your own family and your own kids and reflect on your own life. And you have time to think that Hashem is looking at us more than anyone else. That's what Hashem is for. So that is the message for us. That we're starting this Parsha is freedom. Freedom starts with what? Knowing it's no longer government welfare system. It's you earn your keep. Hashem is directly focused on each and everything. You have a Shkocha Prati specific supervision on you for your benefit. And, you, and the focus is on you. You are important. And if you are important, you have that kind of responsibility. And finally, the Medr says in the last source, and here's the point. The Medr says, in the merit of their belief, the Jews were redeemed from Egypt. The simple meaning is, the Jews believed that God would take them out. Because they believed God would take them out. Rav Tzaddik says, more than that, not only did they have to believe Hashem could take them out, they had to believe in themselves. They had to believe that they could live up to this scary new way of life. A person is used to living on welfare and is told, I want you to live a way where there's going to be a whole different thing. Everything you do matters. The sun rises just for you. The whole world is created for you. You have great opportunities and immense responsibilities. So then that was if that you believed in himself, then it's something I could take you out. If you don't believe that you can live up to that, there's no point you're taking it out. And that really is a big fear of a Baal Tshuva. A Baal Tshuva, that's a big fear. Before you became uh, religious, right, you're one of the faceless masses of Judaism. Now you got this own face. Now the sun's going to shine just for me. me. Now I, I'm going to be religious, I'm keeping Shabbos, whatever. Now that I know, and more than that, now that I know better, God is expecting more from me. And that becomes very scary. That's when a person's being introduced to Yiddish guy, where there's a lot of resent, resistance. <laughs> Hang on. I don't want Hashem to notice me that much because if I know better, then He'll punish me if I don't do what's right. Let me better like all the secular Jews who don't know anything better and God just lets them go. They become the faceless masses. The faceless mass can get away for a long time with nothing and be happy with nothing, be happy living on welfare. Now, now that I, 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 uh, I know better, you know, uh, person fears, uh, what's going to happen you know, if a holocaust happens? My friend who's totally assimilated, he'll, he'll, he'll blend to the walls. He won't be noticed. I'm a marked man. Hashem says that's the challenge. And that's the challenge even for religious Jews. Even for people who are born religious Jews. Don't you think they feel they're part of the faceless masses? All the religious Jews who, who compromise on Torah and halacha. Because they feel like they're the faceless masses too. So the Jew has, you, the real thing is you can't be afraid. Cannot be afraid to break out of the 26 generations of irrigation. You have to break into the knowledge that Hashem is going to hold the grounds to you. And this week and this Shabbos is where Hashem gives you the spiritual strength to work on that and to achieve success in that. So Hashem should give us all, myself included, the bracha that, you know, that when you're going to go to your computer and now there's all kinds of places for, for the computer to take you, places that Hashem wants you to go and places Hashem doesn't want you to go, you say, Hashem, you know, just like they have, they have these things, what do they have now that they could trace everything you do on the computer, right? Somehow, they, you know, somebody can hack into you, they can know everything you did, right? 
Just know Hashem is watching everything. And it's not to punish you. He's watching to see all the good things you're doing. There is, and he wants to make the sun rise for you. And if you believe it, then you're going to live up to that potential. Okay, have a good day. Shkaya.